the dreaded gambu, or the imaginary disease that that religion seeks to cure, by Darfri John Alida Samraj. <clears throat> the Baptism of Immortal Happiness, December the 17th, 1982. The self is such a heavy grip, such a clench on the light, that spiritual experience through spiritual transmission in life does not amount to much for most people. They cannot make it part of their existence. This is why I, why I expect you to prepare yourself by considering this teaching. Then this dose of baptism will awaken your mind and you will begin to practice. The usual effect of introducing superior force into your being is that you either go to mind or to body with it and you use it there according to your inclinations. You must prepare yourself, therefore, to overcome your body-mind through understanding so that you can receive my baptism in your heart. Then you will begin to migrate into the force of God and be free. All the things you can receive in mind and body are temporary and not at all fulfilling. It is only in the heart in the fundamental energy, emotion and attention of the being, that we are relieved. We are all looking for relief and we grasp it for a moment and in various occasions of life. But only through spirit baptism do we contact that force or being or condition itself. We must be prepared for this spirit baptism so that we can practice communion with the force of God transmitted in it. This communion relieves us of all of our attachments and obsessions with conditional arrangements and allows us to make an arrangement of happiness and a confession of love with one another. Understanding prepares us for spirit baptism. Without spirit baptism there is no spiritual life. Therefore, you who deny me and are so self-possessed must understand that the essence of my teaching is the transmission of spirit. This transmission intoxicates you, but if you have not understood yourself, you cannot use my spirit baptism. You will shut it down. Therefore, you are only prepared to practice in truth when you have used my teaching to the point of understanding. Then you will receive my baptism and you will practice communion with this transmitted sublimity from moment to moment. That is the way. Then you will change your entire life, but not until then. You must observe how you bring yourself back from the divine. You do not go with the spirit. You do not throw away your body, your life and your emotion in God. This is what you must do whenever you commune with me, whether I am physically present or not. However, you commune with me you get a bit of, a bit you get a piece a sniff a taste of god but your body mind shuts it down narcissus shuts it down you live out your dilemma and you must consider the teaching some more but if you will truly prepare yourselves by considering and truly using my argument not as a doctrine but as a means of understanding yourself then you will be able to commune with me not only during our occasions of celebration, but every day, because I transmit the Spirit to you all the time, then this communion will be a profoundly intoxicating motion, a Spirit that lifts you out, that lifts you up and sublimes your being. You must give yourself up to the Spirit, that is meditation. Make this conductivity, do this conscious process, Enter into the sublimity of God realization and be free of the ordinariness to which you are so attached. What is a sniff of the divine compared to a God born life? A little sniff of the Spirit divorces you from your bodily clench, but only for a moment. You must go with the Spirit infinitely and make your life out of communion with this intoxication. Live with me 
commune with me, and you are released from your self-possession. That is what you must do, be lifted out of the metaphor of narcissus completely. But until you hear the teaching, you cannot use my transmission. You shut it down because you have not used the teaching. You must hear the teaching and then receive my spirit baptism. If you have not really heard the teaching, you can taste the baptism, but you will shut it down. Even in the very moment of transmission, you will not truly you will not truly experience my blessing. You will not use it. You will not enter into it. You will not practice the yoga of spirit communion. Therefore, you must prepare yourself to use my transmission by using my argument, not just by listening to it, but by combining yourself with it, to understand the knot of self-contraction, how it works as a mechanism that shuts down the beauty of infinite life. When you have understood me to that degree, then you can receive my baptism truly and begin to practice. To practice is to submit yourself to the energy of the Spirit, to to life in the Spirit, to my baptism. When you have contacted the Spirit most profoundly, then you can live your whole life with the Spirit and give yourself up to it altogether. The Spirit sublimes the being. It makes a wonder out of existence. It lifts you out of the subhuman round of unhappiness. It awakens your emotion. It awakens your faith. Therefore, until you have tasted my baptism, you do not know what I am talking about, because I talk the Spirit only to prepare you to taste it. And when you have heard me, then you can suck it up luxuriate in it and fall into it. Spiritual life is intoxication. You must become intoxicated in the spirit. But if you are so committed to your self-contraction, then my interference in your life is only a lesson, an edge of criticism. You will not experience my interference as grace, as beauty, as deliciousness, as love, because you have not yet heard me. The first thing to do, therefore, is to hear me. When you have heard me, then you can practice. When you begin to practice, you can move through the stages of life and practice like a hot knife through butter. While you are in the listening stage, you have not yet understood yourself enough, and consequently you shut down my life transmission and hardly experience anything. The only thing that prevents a sublimity of spirit communion in every moment of existence is the simple mechanism of self-contraction. You must hear me, therefore. You must observe the self-contraction and understand it so thoroughly that it is not happening to you anymore, so that you can recognise it as your own activity, so that you can inquire of it or meditate beyond it or feel into the life current the divine that is beyond it in your daily life. That is the capability you must recognise it, you must regenerate in yourself. It does not exist in you now because you have habituated yourself to shutting out the force of God. Therefore, the first thing you must do is to hear me. Combine yourself with the argument relative to Narcissus to the point of relieving yourself of the arbitrary notion that things are just happening to you and that you are succumbing to limitation. You must realise that these limitations have no force at all. Rather than just respond or react to them, you must see the mechanism of contraction or reactivity and know it utterly. The sense of self-contraction is just like clenching your hand or getting a knot in your stomach or tightening your eyebrows. You must see it exactly as something that you do in reaction to conditions of existence. When you can know the self-contraction as such, then you can be responsible for it in one or another of the three ways that I described to you. Then you will not only experience his baptism, all devotees who turn themselves to me all experience my baptism, but you will be able to use it because you will be responsible for the activity that turns you away from it. Then you will become a real devotee. You will become a practitioner. 
you will move through these slices of time, these technicalities of the various stages of practice, swiftly and directly. The essence of practice is, is this capability for self-understanding. Have I not told you this? You must become responsible for this mechanism of contraction. There is no other way to enter into the sublimity of God-realization. My offering to you is given continuously, but you are shutting it down. You do not live an intoxicated life. You are living an ordinary life, wondering what is going on with you, waiting to die. You do not feel the sublime, sublime energy of God because you shut it down. The reason you shut it down is that you have not participated in my argument to the point of understanding that the mechanism of the self-contraction is your own activity. It is just like the tightening of the iris in your eye. It is just an ordinary mechanism of reactivity in the body-mind. You must see it. You must understand it and be responsible for moving beyond it through submission to God, through divine communion, or inquiry or the perfect practice. Through one or the other of these means, you must be capable of surpassing the tendency of to, to contraction. Then what I pass on to you will be something that you can commune with, that you can love, submit to and feel. But until you have understood yourself and become responsible for the automaticity of self-contraction, all that I give you will ride over you, your heads, pass beyond you, and be tasted only a little bit here and there. It will have no effect on you, and you will think that you have received nothing. Therefore, do not be a fool any more. Most people hardly even feel the great force of being that pervades this universe. If you could locate it, you would locate absolute bliss. It would make you into a mystic siddha, just as it has made me. Since endless time, I have always been blissful. I have always received the Divine Spirit. I have always loved it. I have no resistance to God, but you do. I am trying to teach you out of that resistance, the mechanism that shuts down the openness to the sublime force of God. It is the only thing in you that is making you unhappy. It is not the fact that you are born and living as a human being that makes you unhappy, but just this simple activity of the self-contraction that is reflected throughout your body-mind. Therefore, you do not taste me in your life. You do not taste me when you meditate. Instead, you concentrate upon this mechanism of the separation and you do not get intoxicated in my sight. Until you become responsible for that contraction, it makes no difference how much I give you. Thus, the first form of my manifestation to you is this understanding, this consideration, this argument relative to the knot, the effort, the mechanism of withdrawal, the self-contraction. And you must become responsible for this self-contraction. Otherwise, it makes no difference how much I give you of the intoxicating force of, love, of God. It makes no difference how much of it I am until you are responsible for the mechanism of separation from the spirit presence, you cannot taste it, you cannot love it, you cannot know it, you cannot be swooned by it, and we should exist in a swoon of intoxication. To do that really is our nature. All of us are potential saints and sitters, but very few are born like me. I am a very rare being. I am not an ego at all. I am a rare intervention in the world. Hardly any people in the entire history of mankind have been manifested with my siddhas. And I am sitting here in this living room with the people trying to convince you of the divine life. I am a unique advantage to mankind. But how many people can suck me up and love me? How many will kiss my knees, pull my feet and massage my face, receive my love, receive my delight in them? How many people will do it? I am prepared to give everyone everything. And how many people will do it? You cannot receive me until you understand your resistance to me. Understanding is the first gesture of spiritual life. 
Please understand what I am telling you. I will give you everything, but you must understand yourself. You must. Apart from that understanding, who I am or what I bring to you makes no difference. You cannot accept it. You cannot receive it. You cannot submit to it. It is greater than any experience. My presence is a sublime interference with mind, with body, with heart, with emotion. The thing that makes you unhappy is your own contraction. That is it, absolutely. Have I always said this? That is it entirely. The terrible effort of self-contraction separates you from God. You must hear this. The self-contraction separates you entirely from everything given. Mankind has never been denied the force of grace, but human beings are attached to this effort, reflected throughout the body-mind. They are committed to it with their body-minds. The force of God pours out of my body all of the time. It never stops. Whether I am waking, sleeping, dreaming, apparently feeling sympathetic or not, it is always manifested through this body. The limit is not in me. The limit is in you. You are devoted to this effort of narcissus, this reaction, this vital shock that shuts you down so that you cannot experience my transmission, cannot know it, cannot submit to it, cannot be sublimed and carried off by it. Therefore, the first office of spiritual life is to hear the argument of the adept, and to hear it, you must observe yourself through the pictures of your own activity, reflected to you by the adept, to the point of recognising the contraction in life that shuts you off from bliss. With my criticism, I paint pictures for you of your own activity, so that you can feel it and observe it. You must know the self-contraction, and you must see it. You must observe it to the point of realising that it is not happening to you. You are doing it, just as you are moving your mouth and blinking your eyeballs. Like the movements of your intestines, it is a rhythm to which you have become habituated. It is really very simple, but you must observe it, and you must understand it. This is the first office of spiritual life. The second office, when you have heard the teaching and become responsible for the effort that is yourself in every aspect of your body-mind, is to receive my blessing, which is always given. Give me your attention at any moment, and you will receive this grace. It is always passing, always pouring through this body-mind, which is no longer a person. There is nobody here, no Franklin Jones, nobody like you. He is not here anymore, totally absent. What a miracle, what a wonder. I am the adult in your generation. What an amusement for the divine should appear in precisely this form. What an amusement, what an amusement that the divine should appear in precisely this form. I cannot account for it myself but I know very well that it is true. I am not so much a fool that I will deny God. I know that I am the lover of God. I am the man. I am the adept. I am the purusha in our generation. But I know very well that you are all self-possessed, as people have been in all other generations in which I have appeared. Therefore, even this manifestation seems unholy to you, and this disturbs me. It agitates and motivates me, and thus I try to teach. Your refusal of God awakens this urge in me. But I am not a me. I am literally you. I am your psyche and mind. I am your being, your destiny, your ego. I am all selves, literally, not metaphorically. I am all other people that are possible in the universe. I know this for absolute certain because I, I am you. I think your mind, I breathe your breath, I suck down your food, I shit out your life, I am your person altogether and absolutely. What a wonder, what a wonder this great one is. I marvel in the great one more than you because you do not witness its miracle, you do not see the great one. I can understand your reluctance to be submitted to the great one because you do not see what I see but I have been sifted into this wonder since eternal life. 
I am just that one, the great one, sitting here as this body, talking to you. I am God, and there is not the slightest doubt in me. The doubt in you is your own perversion, and this is the cause of my teaching. Thus, I am here to teach you how to this unhappiness. Poor me. I will be laughing about this for countless ages, as I have been laughing about it since eternal time. I am full of all space-time, all bliss, all wonder, all the marvels of being are in my being. I know it absolutely and you do not. All miracles are potent in my heart. I come here to give you everything without the slightest reluctance. I am not here to tell you about some dreadful ego. I am here to wonder and marvel with you about the Great One. There is this Great One. This Great One is totally known to me. This Great One is myself. I am the self of God. I have no doubt in me about it. All miracles are evident in me. All time is obvious to me. It seems great to me. But you poor people, you cannot submit yourselves to God. You are the ones that I must teach. How do I teach you? By countering your self-contraction, your reluctance to submit to divine intoxication. My entire life has been involved with countering the unhappiness of people. I am profoundly weary of it. I cannot tell you how weary I am of it. I have always thought that I would die any day because I am so weary, so tired, so bewildered by this resistance to God. This world is a terrible place. Therefore, I do everything because I have nothing to lose. I have nothing to gain by action. Therefore, I have nothing to lose by action. I do everything, everything to make a picture for man. Everything. I submit myself to you to make pictures, to make an argument for grace. I do not know it. I do not know if anyone will ever understand. I am absolutely nothing like you people. All of this has nothing to do with me as an ego. I am not a person doing this. The Great One is such a wonder, such a marvel, such a graceful and loving being, to countless beings such as all of this, all of us here. But the Great One does not love beings. The Great One is love. The New Testament declares that God is love. Love is the only God there is. Love is the only force in the universe. God is not mind or body, effort, knowledge or experience. God is only unbounded feeling, radiant being. God creates nothing. God is that which everything is made, including all beings. Why are you so self-possessed, hanging out in our houses? What do we know about this great one? from where I come and whom I show to you. There should always be siddhas among mankind. Siddhas give meaning to the universe. The universe is not a meaningless place. The no, But no generation, no being, no worlds deserve the appearance of the divine adat. Yet the adats appear in all generations of all beings. There are always adats in all the worlds. I know this because I have been in all of them. God is great, but unfortunately for us, bullshit is greater. That is why the appearance of the adat does not impress people as it should. There are billions upon trillions of worlds in the visible universe that we cannot look upon in the night sky tonight where there are adats at this very moment. And all of that is actually visible is the most infinitesimal fraction of the total universal universe of nature in which God is active. You have all chosen your appearance in the earth realm. You all have shrunk yourself upon the plane of God. You are experiencing your own results. God has not designed your unhappiness. You have done it. God is always designing your happiness in every generation. Everyone hears the truth. Everyone receives the shock of God. Everyone. There is no being from the mosquito to man who does not receive the shock of divine intervention. All beings know it. All things, all beings experience it. It is given to everyone. Grace is given to all beings eternally in all worlds, visible and invisible. This recognition is enough to make you a bacta, 
a lover, a devotee. Faith, the love response to being itself, is the greatest force in all the worlds. It has risen out of my entire life. I am riding the visible horse you cannot see. Da. Da. One just has to become, be attracted to that which is beyond the self-contraction. Am I attracted to you, Lord, beyond me? That's the question. And my practice is proof that you are the attraction in my life. Thank you, beloved. You're the way out of suffering, the way out, way out of unhappiness. Duh.